Hi, it's Alan, and welcome back to the Library of Alexandria. I got a fresh new review coming here today, and it's gonna be Boom! Sharp's Tiger by Bernard Cornwell. This is the first book chronologically in the Sharp series. It was not the first one written, but it does take place earliest in the timeline, taking place in 1799, during Britain's solidification of its Indian provinces. Now, all of the Sharp books take place in the period right before and during the Napoleonic Wars. Here in Sharp's Tiger, Napoleon and his armies are still in Egypt, and so Britain is trying to put down a rebellion by the Tipu Sultan in India before Napoleon can get free of Egypt and come and push them out of India where there are also French troops. This is a historical fiction novel. It is not fantasy. There are no fantastic elements. It's just straight up historical fiction and dang is it a good one. So I like to read the little blurbs on the back so you can kind of know what you're in store for and I can tell you if in fact the book is about this. An inexperienced young private in His Majesty's service, Richard Sharp, is part of a military expedition to India to push the ruthless Tipu of Mysore from his throne and drive out his French allies. By posing as a deserter, he hopes to penetrate the Tipu's city, avoid a well-laid trap, and make contact with a captive Scottish spy. But while success will make Sharp a sergeant, failure will place him at the mercy of the evil despot's brutal executioners, or worse still, his hungry, man-eating tigers. And yes, that's that's exactly what this book is about. So we have Private Sharp, just a regular recruit in the British military in India, and he gets involved in this larger plan to pretend to be a deserter to get information that one of their spies has but has been captured and has to smuggle it out of the city. And it concerns and it concerns the defenses of the city they're about to siege, Seringapatam. And if he doesn't get that information back to the British military, they're walking right into a trap. So you've got that kind of sword of Damocles hanging over the entire proceeding. This book is largely concerning a siege. I've realized with filming some of these reviews that I really, really like books about sieges. And Bernard Cornwell does a siege with the best of them. And so the plot at large is not so much will the British take the city of Seringapatam? Because history tells us that yes, they indeed did take Seringapatam, but it's will this fictional character, Sharp, get that message out? What will the loss be? Does, does the British military's plan work or do they walk into an ambush and what becomes of the Tipu Sultan afterward? Now, what makes this different than just an academic retelling of the British invasion of India are the characters involved. And at its heart, all of the Sharp novels star private in this book, Private Richard Sharp. He is not well educated. He was a thief and a murderer on the streets of Britain, and his choice was go to prison and possibly be hanged or join up in the British military. And so obviously he chose the latter. And so he's here because what other options did he have very much like many of the other recruits in the British military. If you don't know how the British military worked at that time, you were recruits were taken, but officers were almost never brought up from the ranks. Officer commissions were purchased. So if you were the member of a of a well-to-do family, they could pay for you to get like a lieutenancy or a, or a captaincy or an ensignship and you would join the military as an officer. And then when you retired, you would then sell that commission to somebody else. So some other well-to-do young nobleman could buy that commission. Now, whether or not you think it was a good idea, uh, that's up to you, but this is how the British military worked. Now, from the ranks, you could rise to sergeant, but only through military glory or saving an officer's life or something to that effect. So we start with Richard Sharp, and so he's our main character, and he's tough as nails. He can't read, but he's tall. We're told he's taller than the other soldiers. He's a fighter, a scrapper. 
He, as soon as they go on the mission, an officer is with him and he immediately takes charge because Sharp wants to survive. At the very beginning of the novel, one of his first uh, thoughts that we hear is that he's thinking of deserting anyway. And so Sharp is a, a gutter fighter, a do whatever it takes to survive. He's not going to take any crap from anybody, certainly if they're not, if they're going to get in his way between what he's trying to do and certain death, essentially. But he is a soldier. So despite the fact that the army treats him like garbage, he is still a patriot. He's a, he's a red coat through and through. He never actually considers going over to the other side, even though he's pretending that, because his blood runs British and he's not willing to betray his mother country. But he also wants to do the right thing. He has this very noble quality of him where he wants to protect his friend's widow, he's kind of fallen in love with her as well, and he wants to do anything he can to protect her. Now, one of the people he has to protect her from is one of the greatest villains in all of literary history. And if you've read the Sharp books, you 100% agree with me. Sergeant Obadiah Hakeswill is one of the most despicable rotten, you want to throw the book across the room because you can't believe this guy is still alive causing the trouble he's causing that I have ever read in my entire life. And this includes fantasy books with guys trying to destroy the world. Obadiah Hakeswill is this small-minded little man who gets off on abusing and mistreating and extorting the soldiers under him. And there's nothing they can do because he is a sergeant and they are not. He is a liar. He pretends to be a Christian. In fact, as he's abusing his soldiers, he's like, oh, it says so in the scriptures. No, it doesn't. One character actually says, Stop. It does not say that. If you say it again, I'm going to beat the tar out of you. Now, obviously, this guy is higher than Hakeswill, or he could not get away with that. And so Hakeswill, he is just a snake. He's on no one's side. He is. He has betrayal running through his veins. Hakeswill is awful. He is not only in this book. He is a recurring villain in the Sharp books, and I hate him. I hate him. I hate him. If you've read this book or if you read this book, you too will hate Obadiah Hakeswill. He is a snake in British soldiers' clothing. Some of the other Brits that have a major role here are actually characters from history. We've got Colonel Arthur Wellesley, who became the Duke of Wellington, the guy who actually beat Napoleon. That's a real character. Obviously, Cornwell has taken some licenses here, but Wellesley is cold and he's mean. He doesn't like interrupting floggings. He thinks that the men need to be flogged to keep discipline. He hates the plan of Sharp having to pretend to be a deserter. He just kind of looks at the rank and file with contempt because most of them are ruffians and vagabonds and ne'er-do-wells and rapscallions and other things that describe people who get down in the mud and aren't educated or well-bred or refined. And so we see Wellesley here and he's extremely unlikable even though historically we know that he becomes an absolutely brilliant commander. In fact, during the siege of Seringapatam, Wellesley authorizes a night raid that doesn't go really well, and it's, it's actually historically his only military defeat. And this particular thing makes Wellesley hate the idea of night raids for the rest of his career. We also have a major general, Baird, who is this He's, he's a Highlander, this typ typical Scotsman bellowing at the top of his lungs. He's got a huge claymore that he goes to, that he fights on the front line during the siege with it, just bellowing for his clansmen coming with their kilt and they're just terrifying the Indian forces. We also see Colonel McCandless, who is the British spy who was captured, very religious man gets the information that he needs to smuggle out to Wellesley and to Baird. And so Sharp and an officer, William Lawford, who's actually the nephew of McCandless, are the ones who go on this plan to try to extract him, but if not him, then certainly his information. And the interplay between Sharp 
and Lawford. Lawford, who is a gentleman and an officer and above Sharp Station. And Sharp, the guy who's going to do anything it can to survive. The second they get away from the actual military, the exchanges between those two are really fun to watch because Lawford doesn't know anything about the kind of life that Sharp or the rank and file lead. And he kind of admires Sharp and the fact that Sharp is go get him and will do anything and takes charge. But at the same time, he bristles because that's not the way it's supposed to work. He's the officer, not Private Sharp. And so the, the dialogue and relationship between Lawford and Sharp is actually some of the best in the book. The final major character is the Tipu Sultan himself. We get to see a lot of things from the Tipu side. The Sultan is constantly thinking about when he should show mercy and when he should be cruel. He's a good fighter. He was a soldier for a long time. He is Muslim, but many of his subjects are Hindu, and so he's trying to keep their cooperation by making exceptions for them and giving them benefits and places in his high court and his, in his military. He knows that a ruler can't be too cruel because that's how people revolt against you and you can't be too merciful because that's how you get straight up murked and assassinated. So the Tipu Sultan himself is actually a really interesting character. A guy who came up from the military but now rules the kingdom of Mysore and is allied with the French to try to push the British out of his country. And so those are the main players we have in this plot. And Cornwell does a great job differentiating between them. Each of them has a distinctive voice. Uh, people like Sharp and Hakeswill, who are uneducated, speak differently than people like Wellesley, who is about as refined as it gets, or Baird, the Highlander, who doesn't talk like Wellesley, but also doesn't talk like the rank and file. And even among the rank like Hakeswill and Sharp, they even sound completely different. So I think the dialogue is great. Characterization is really nuanced. These are three-dimensional characters, despite the fact that they're mostly just soldiers, and they could be very, they could end up being really, really similar. But Cornwell does a really good job of showing you what it would be like to be in the military. The officers and the soldiers are not friends. They're not even allowed to talk to each other unless they're spoken to. Most of the rank and file actually hates the officers, and that feeling is often mutual between the officers and the rank and file. And that's really weird to see that I don't know how you command people when you hate them and they can feel that and they hate you in return. It's bizarre. Even more contrasting is the difference between the British army that governs by fear of punishment and they flog you if you get out of line and it's very, very just draconian in its discipline. But then you get to see, as Sharp's a deserter, you get to see what it's like in the French military where men can be promoted just for doing a good job and they don't flog because they think it's a barbaric practice and Sharp meets the really jovial and kindly Colonel Goudin, who is a nice guy and nothing like the officers in the British military. So the relationship between Sharp and the French colonel is also really cool, that he respects Colonel Goudin probably more than he respects his own officers, and yet Sharp is a redcoat through and through. So. It's weird seeing that the British who conquered the known world during this time have such a different way of running their military than the French did. I also like the fact that Cornwell talks about how most of the soldiers couldn't read or write. And I read a lot of fantasy books, and I don't see this a ton, in, even in fantasy books, where people don't know how to read. It's almost taken for granted that every character is going to kind of know how to read and know how to write. So it's just interesting to bring us back to the kind of men that the British recruited to die for them in their foreign wars. Hey everybody, so Spurgeon, my cat Spurgeon came to join us. He is also British, so he came to see how the British military was doing in the siege of Seringapatam. And so it's funny because you actually end up hating the British and liking the French, even though the British are the good guys in this, and those are the guys you're supposed to be rooting for. But the British are jerks, man. The British suck. They're mean. They're mean to our hero, Sharp, and we want Sharp to win, and we're rooting for him every step of the way. There's just this tension constantly. Are Sharp and Lawford going to get the information? Are they going to save Colonel McCandless? 
Are they going to be able to get out of the city if they get the information? That's always hanging over your head and you're just like flipping the pages and when an obstacle's thrown in their, in their way, you're like, oh no, they've had it now. But then they get out of it. And Cornwell does a really good job of having Sharp get out of situations in a logical manner. Sharp, I don't feel, has plot armor, even though you know Sharp's not gonna die because there are like 20 books in the Sharp series and they're all called Sharp's something, which means that Sharp has to remain a character. But despite the fact that you know Sharp's going to live, you're still on the edge of your seat in suspense on how is he gonna get out of it. And the author does a credible job getting Sharp out of these scrapes without it seeming like deus ex machina. Talking about the writing style, Cornwell's writing style is pretty straightforward, no frills, to the point. It's like a military historian, who, which I think Cornwell is, is writing it. it. It's not flowery. It is third person omniscient, which so many fantasy books these days are third person limited, that that's what I'm used to. So it was kind of jarring to be reading and be in Sharp's head and then in the same chapter jump into Wellesley's head or the Tipu's head or heavens for Fen Hakeswill's head. You don't want to be in there very long. There's spiders and scorpions and like fire and torture devices there. He's just terrible and you're hoping to jump out of his head as quickly as possible. I've said in my other videos that I really like military fiction and this is no different. Many of the books I read have sieges in them and Cornwell is fantastic at writing a siege. A siege, if you don't know, is when a city has protective walls and the attacking army has to either one, break down the wall, two, scale the wall with siege ramps, etc., or three, block off all supplies and starve the enemy out. And this siege is fantastically written. You're right there in the action. Cornwell's prose is fast. It's jumping back and forth. It is bloody. His fight scenes and battle scenes do not hold anything back. You are right there in the front lines fighting with them. The horrors of war are evident. The Sharp books actually introduced me to the concept of the forlorn hope. And if you don't know what that is, when the British would siege a city, when they would make a hole in the wall, that hole would be called the Forlorn Hope because it's this very small hole and the British have to fight their way through it and take the city that way. But this very small opening is obviously heavily guarded and so your chances of actually getting through and taking the walls or opening the gates are approaching 0%. But any man who made it through the Forlorn Hope could be promoted to officers. So this is one of the only ways that a rank and file could be promoted to officer without purchasing a commission. But they are bloody, bloody, bloody affairs. I know the third book chronologically, Sharp's Fortress, is about a particularly terrible forlorn hope. But we see that concept in here and you look at it and you can't believe the British would resort to anything so barbaric where they know their men are gonna die but they throw them in anyway because the officers don't really care about the lives of the rank and file. Now because this is military fiction, there is a lot of military terminology that he doesn't bother explaining to you. The difference between all the different cannons, you just kind of have to figure out. It's talking about the size of the cannonball. Each of them has a different size shot that it uses. Military formations, it's a lot to keep track in your head. If you're not really good at picturing a lot of moving parts spatially in your head, the battle can be a little bit confusing, but I found that fine because I can imagine during an actual battle, things aren't super straightforward and it's confusing and it's hard to tell really what's going on of what, what these guys are doing over here because you can't see anything because of the massive amounts of dust and dead bodies here and you hear thundering cannon over there and it's just boom, boom, boom. Cornwall does an, does an amazing job bringing us right into the battlefield, into the siege of this impenetrable city. Despite how much I like Sharp's Tiger, this book is not for everyone. If you don't like military fiction, you're not going to like this. If you don't like historical fiction, you're not going to like it. If you don't like big bloody battles, 
you're not going to like this book probably as much. If anything I've talked about so far sounds boring to you, then maybe you shouldn't read it. But if you're keeping an open mind, I 100% recommend Sharp's Tiger. On the King Finn approval system from Horrible Minus all the way up to Superb Plus, I give Sharp's Tiger a solid excellent minus to excellent. It is one of my favorite of the Sharp books. They're pretty easy to read. Sometimes it can get bogged down in military formation and the minutia of battle, but all in all, especially when it's dealing with Sharp and less so the actual military battles, it's really easy to read, suspenseful, it keeps you turning the pages, and I absolutely recommend it. If you like this video, say so in the comments. If you've read any of the Sharp books, absolutely tell me in the comments. If you've read a bunch of the Sharps books, tell me which one your favorite is. If I've inspired you to go read it, please go read it. Come back and we'll have a conversation about it in the comments. Thank you guys for watching and I'll see you next time.